Um, so we're looking at today, what shall I do? This is a, a lesson styled on the questions that went to John the Baptist, which is following the ideas we started last week about faith and works going together. John was preaching as recorded in Luke 3, 10 and 11. The crowds asked, what then shall we do? And I'm assuming that you want to do what God wants you to do. That um, I hope is true. And he answered, whoever has two tunics is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. Um, the tunic is uh, a covering, a garment that's next to the skin. So this is, um, and we don't have anything like this really. Um, it's just to say, like, this is the critical garment. Then over this, you would wear your coat or whatever costume, if you have a costume of some kind. But the critical garment is the tunic. So the covering of, and food, as he said, and whoever has food is to do likewise. So the, the idea that, you know, we have covering, we have food, clothing, and shelter is what we say in, in our uh, way of speaking. Sometimes we have enough to share, and the scriptures tell us that that's what we ought to do is share, and that uh, we are responsible for one another. We know what the law says, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Um, this is saying, well, when you've got extra, that extra is to help someone else. And I've got a couple of passages to look at here without going back too far into the law. Um, one of the places in the law that I always think about in connection with this is how that you are not supposed to glean the fields and you're not supposed to um, uh, harvest the corners of the fields either. You're supposed to leave those there for the poor to come and, and to eat that. Um, it's just part of the law that we ought to be thinking about those that are less fortunate, that we ought to make uh, provision for that, make plans for that, leave room for charity. Uh, that's the meaning of it. First Timothy 6, 17, 18, and 19. The instruction for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, meaning arrogant, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. The rich are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. And I'm going to go back over this. In the 17th verse, again, the rich in this present world. So we we do sometimes have uh, more than is necessary. Not everybody is rich, I understand. But um, we certainly have more than we need very often and have enough to share very often. And in our country, you know, in the United States, we are relatively wealthy compared to the rest of the world. Um, whether you you know, whether you realize it or not. I do think it's good for children to see these things. It's good to take um, your kids or young people to Mexico or India or something. Let them see how the rest of the world lives uh, because what we've got here is pretty grand, uh, which is not to say that you should feel guilty or you've done something wrong. You didn't ask to be born and neither did I. Neither did they in Mexico, is the point. Um, it's good to recognize how much we have been blessed in this country. And um, I'm not saying you should, you know, whatever political opinions or political positions, I don't care about such matters. I am saying that thankfulness ought to characterize us. And we ought to understand that we, in a lot of measures and in a lot of ways, are, are among the rich in this present age. That's all we're getting at. You might say, well, I'm not rich, but do you have more than you need? <laughs> is the idea. You have enough to be able to share. Well, 
if we do, we shouldn't be haughty, proud, if you will, about that fact. Um, as we said before, I, you know, I didn't ask to be born, and I, this just happened. I happened to show up at this time in this place. <laughs> Could have been a lot worse, by all means. Nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. That's, that is the truth. Riches are uncertain. And I know the rich always think they have a parachute, they're going to get out, they're going to survive. That true. Um, if there's time, if there's warning, if your currency is available to you, um, it doesn't matter how rich you are, you know, when a bullet comes flying, right? doesn't matter. So there are things uh, in this world that trump uh, riches. Don't trust them. Trust God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. So we ought to give thanks for the good that we have. But when we are rich, we are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. So what you have, you use it for good purposes. You put it towards what is good. Um, not just rich in you know, belongings, but rich in good works. Generous and ready to share. These should characterize the child of God who has more than enough. And this is how you store up treasure for as a good foundation for the future, to take hold of what is truly life. Uh, it's true, uh, in, you know, in the world of finance, people are always trying to store up treasure as a good foundation for the future in, you know, some retirement shelter or something of this nature, savings accounts to, to be there for tomorrow. And this is always the goal. But um, really, the way that we store up treasure for the future is to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share. This God will bless, and this is an eternal thing. To take hold of that which is truly life, that brings into focus the idea that, you know, the reality of God is the reality. <laughs> um, things may seem to be real, if you will, but nothing is more real than God. I mean, Eternity is a long time, and whatever we do in this short time here, uh, you know, this time is short, and it just gets shorter and shorter in the rearview mirror as eternity goes on, and uh, our decisions need to accord with, you know, with what we, what's set before us. The right priority is eternity, and it clearly is eternity, and that's a real thing that we will all meet. Now, the other place um, regarding having two tunics is Hebrews 13. Um, it's, it's basically one through six. I cut out the fourth verse because it's not immediately apparent how it has to do with finances. That's, and then we just have other things we need to get to. So Hebrews 13, one to three, let brotherly, let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. Thereby, some have entertained angels unwittingly. Remember those who are in prison as though you were in prison with them and those who are mistreated since you also are in the body. Keep your life free from love of money. Be content with what you have for he has said I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so we can confidently say the Lord is my helper I will not fear. What can man do to me? Again, there's a, there's a reality of the spiritual future in this way of thinking. You say, I will not fear. What can man do to me? You say, well, man can do a lot of things that hurt. Yeah, I understand. But the perspective here is that there is eternity and that God is more to be feared than man. And whatever price we pay here will nonetheless be worth it in eternity, which will pay itself back over and over and over. Now going back to the uh, first verse, brotherly love is there. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's how it starts. Then the uh, hospitality for strangers is about receiving somebody who is not from here, who is not uh, experienced uh, 
who does not know the rules or the ropes and needs, you know, needs to be provided for, whether that be they need somewhere to stay or they need something to eat or they need to know um, whatever it might be. Uh, you know, what a legitimate taxi cab looks like versus an illegitimate one that you don't want to get into. Right, things of this nature are all hospitality. You're helping somebody who doesn't know. Um, and this is part of having two tunics, giving to somebody who has none. You, you as the native, you as the person who lives here, know how things are, where the tricks are, where the traps are. You help somebody else who doesn't know those things. That is sharing your tunic. Uh, and some have entertained angels unwittingly. That's true. Um, I, you know, people wonder if that happens today. Truth be told, I don't know, but um, I know for sure that we have record of it. And I think what he's talking about is in the scriptures. This happens a lot. Um, Lot was very kind to the messengers that came to his home, not realizing that this is of God. <laughs> uh, and Abraham. And, and Manoah and, and Samson's mother, you know, so many people have done this. Which is to say, how do you behave when nobody's looking or when it seems like nobody's looking? There are people who take advantage, which is the opposite of showing hospitality to strangers. There are people who take advantage of these, you know, who are not aware, who do not realize. So we have to be uh, the force for good in the opposite direction. There are persons in the first century who are imprisoned because of the faith. And he said, remember them as though you were with them and those who are mistreated in, also in the faith because you also are in the body. A reminder that though you are here now and though you live in this place now, um, it may not always be so. This place could change. Your lot in life could change. Your position or location could change. Um, all of it just to remind us that, yes, we are in the body. Things happen. It's true. And that the money is not the thing to love. The brother is the thing to love. The brother, love, brotherly love. Let that continue. Be content with what you have is another thing that John said when they asked him what to do. And even in the place where we just were in 1 Timothy 6, he says, Con uh, godliness with contentment is great gain. We brought nothing into the world, we can take nothing out of it. But the reason we can be content is the Lord has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And that is true. We have confidence when we say the Lord is my helper, I will not fear what can man do to me. Walking with God is certainly worth it. That's going to pay off in the end, even if perhaps here you might suffer for the faith. Not necessarily, but you may. Well, that's about having some freedom that you can share, some knowledge you can share. A second tunic, if you will. Now, we look at the fact that your uh, charitable work is also priestly in nature. As Hebrews 13, 16 reminds us, do not neglect to do good. Do not neglect to share what you have. Such sacrifices are pleasing to God. These are sacrifices. If, if you are able to do something to help somebody else uh, who is a child of God because they are a child of God, uh, you know, say so you, you decide you're, you're going to help somebody, whatever it might be. Uh, maybe some, I remember in Fort Worth many years ago, uh, uh, a woman whose husband left her had to move to another town, and the, the elders and the deacons of that church came to help her move. That was pretty incredible what happened there. And it was really something. They did good, um, and they shared because I believe they paid for that moving there. But um, this idea is that these are sacrifices. 
they took of their time to make this thrive, this day long drive and the effort to, you know, to move things, right? Maybe somebody decides they're going to help the widows and the congregation with something, whatever that might be. They need their lawn mow, they need groceries, whatever. These are considered sacrifices and they're pleasing to God. We offer sacrifices in the law, uh, as, as you read it, pretty much daily. So every day is a new day and there's a new, a new opportunity to do good. Find the good that you can do and do it. In Ephesians 4, 28, on the other hand, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Well, that's interesting. The one who used to take <laughs> uh, illegally, of course, sinfully, the thief, is encouraged instead to work and to work not only to provide for himself, where he used to just take, but now to provide for somebody else too. Let him work honestly with his own hands to have something to share with anyone in need. So to the best of your ability, that's what you should do. Obviously, sometimes you're the person in need. That happens. But other brethren will help you and perhaps your situation will change and you will be the one helping them later or somebody else. This thief is, if you will, whoever he was, has stopped, is now doing honest work, and is using the proceeds of that to do the work of God to help others. And that's the idea. It is a priestly service we're doing. It's a self-sacrifice, selflessness, that ought to characterize how we live. When we say, well, what should we do, John? How do we be right with God? Well, this is what you do. Daily, there are opportunities to do good for others, and you should. There's also a mindset that first letter of Peter in the third chapter, but the first letter of Peter lays this out, and I think it's very similar to thoughts that are in James, because you know both of those are the first letters. But this, I think, is probably the, the single most important verse, 1 Peter 3, 8. All of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. I think this is probably the most important thing. That, you know, Christian, we ought to be in unity uh, of mind, but we also should have sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and humility that characterize us. That's the way that Christians should behave. When we are together, we are focused on the work of the Lord and the work of God and the truth. When somebody suffers, rather, you know, you don't blame them for the wrong or the suffer. Uh, you don't blame them for the bad things that happen to them. You have sympathy. Uh, it's too neat and tidy for the world to blame the suffering person for all the suffering that they're suffering. Uh, was it Sylvester who said suffering so I think so. <laughs> um, it's the world that blames the sufferer for the suffering that they endure. Um, you and I, as the children of God, realize that there's an X factor in truth. There is an X factor, and that is the devil. The devil is real. There is an enemy, a saboteur. Um, there is somebody who seeks to work harm, to make things go the wrong way, uh, to give people the wrong impressions. So you understand that sometimes through no fault of your own, bad things happen to you. You get maligned, you get accused falsely. Um, this does happen. There is an enemy. So sympathy is the right response. Brotherly love, of course, and their heart. You have to be willing to care about what's happening around you. <laughs> Let it get to you so that you act, so that you do something to meet the need, to care for the individual. And a humble mind. 
Yes, humility is necessary if we're going to approach one another in such a way that we're doing what God wants to do. If we're, you know, if we're thinking of ourselves more highly, then you know that's that's a different matter. That's like being a caretaker, and that's not really the case. We're brothers and sisters. It goes on. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. On the contrary, bless. To this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. Well, you know the Lord did not repay evil for evil. He did not revile when he was reviled. He entrusted himself to God. On the contrary, bless. As Jesus himself said, do not curse your enemies, bless your enemies. Pray for those who use you spitefully. And then we quote, whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are open to their prayer. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. <laughs> I think it's a particularly important what he says, let him seek peace and pursue it. Blessed are the peacemakers. Remember, we are not looking for uh, blame. We are not looking for cause, uh, issue, problem, uh, you know, laying something at another's feet, accusations, that kind of thing. We are not looking for that. We are looking for peace. We are looking for how do you put the best construction on this, give people the benefit of the doubt as children of God, um, and realizing that you too are in the flesh. You're not above doing something that someone else is negatively or adversely affected by. You're not above doing wrong. And the Lord hears you when you behave this way, and yet, if you don't, he doesn't listen. It's what he said, you know, if, if we forgive others, he'll forgive us. If we do not forgive others, he will not forgive us. And I think it's true, too, that if we are working for others, then he listens to our prayer. If we close our hearts to our brethren, God closes his heart to us. That just stands to reason. Finally, activation, 1 Peter 4, using the gift. This, I think, is an important thing to note in 1 Peter 4 to get it straight, and we are done. 1 Peter 4, 8 through 11, above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. There's an earnest love, a real love. On the one hand, you know, you're tempted to say, well, I mean no harm, and I do no harm, and I wish everybody well. Okay, but an earnest love uh, is active. You know, there has to be something done. Uh, to help them when they're in need. Love covers a multitude of sins, he says. I don't think that's a reference to what we read earlier, that God that hears the prayers of those who are working on behalf of others. If you show mercy, if you show benefit of the doubt, if you show patience, then, then you will get mercy, benefit of the doubt, and patience. That's just how it works. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. That's the other thing is uh, grumbling. It's one thing to say, yeah, I'm going to do it. I have to do it. Uh, it's another thing to grumble about it while you do it. That just that undoes whatever good was, was being done or whatever credit perhaps you had in the eyes of the Lord. If you complain about doing it, well, you just lost your credit. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's very grace. Well, what gift do we mean here? Um, I think people are confused about this, typically thinking that these are miraculous impartations of the Holy Spirit. But no, he's just talking about what you're good at, the way that we use the word gifted, um, gifted and talented, whatever. Just what are you good at? What has God's grace um, made it that you have, whatever that gift is? And everybody does have a gift. There's, 
things that we're good at, things that we're good for, those are the things that are your gifts that God has given. And different, you know, different people have different functions and different places in society and whatever else, you know, but this is your your special mix, which means that you're you're well suited to specific things. That's all he's getting at. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God. And, you know, uh, very often this is applied to gospel preachers saying, well, if they're going to say anything, let them say just the Bible. And, you know, uh, as much as I agree with that and kind of wish that more people would say that more often, um, the fact is that's not really what we're talking about in this verse. We're here saying that you as a child of God, you the Christian, you should be saying the things that the Bible says. You should be encouraging and enjoining upon others the things that the Bible says. Why are you doing this? Well, this is why. Uh, it's not because we are friends in the flesh or we uh, you know, have something in common in the flesh, uh, you know, more than anybody would who assembles together, uh, obviously. You must have something in common to be in the same physical spot together. But um, this is about the spirit. The oracles of God is what binds us together. Our fellowship, our share, our commonality is the spirit and the truth. It's not about friendships, um, you know, personal relationships, things of this nature. It's the oracles of God. If you love and crave and demand the oracles of God, then, you know, we work side by side. Uh, regardless of, you know, what your favorite sport team is or your favorite snack uh, or your level of education or lack thereof, those things don't matter at all in spirit. The other side of this, whoever serves, let him serve by the strength that God supplies. So if you're able to do something, whatever that thing may be, like we said, there are various needs for various things that people have. Uh, to do that by the strength that God supplies is a thing that happens sometimes when you realize that you're doing this because of God, because of the service of God. This is a sacrifice in your life that you are offering to God because you're a Christian and because the person you are helping is a Christian. That changes the character, you know, that changes the nature of the work that you're doing. And you're cheerful about it, I hope. And doing things um, that are serving, that are helping, <coughs> that are, you know, benefiting you as well as the one who's being served and that are glorifying God in this way. And God will supply strength. You, you will find that you can do a lot more than you thought you could when you are motivated by the truth, when you're motivated by the love for your brother. Stop. <laughs> oh, no. Now I've broken it. Yeah, I figured. Okay, it's back. First Peter 4, 11, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And that's the end. But everything that we are doing as we say or as we do. It's like what he said in another letter, right? Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord. And here he says, in everything, whether, you know, whoever speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. Whoever serves, let him serve with the strength that God gives. In everything, God is glorified through Jesus Christ. And he is the one to whom glory and dominion belong. It's not for our own glory. It's not for our own rule or power. It's for him. We're, you know, conquering territory for the Lord, taking back the encroachment of suffering or discouragement or darkness 
from Satan, capturing it for God, filling that place with light and with love, with help for one another, with genuine care from the heart. That's the way of the Christian. That's the way of the real God. And that's the glory of our Lord forever and ever. Amen. That's why you want to be with him forever and ever, because that's what he's like. As we said, that's the end of that. So today, are you a Christian, a child of God? Well, become a child of God, obtain for yourself forgiveness of sins. Wash away your sins, calling on his name by being buried together with him in baptism for forgiveness of sins, as they did in the New Testament. Today, are you a Christian who has not lived right? Let us pray that you might be restored to God based on your repentance. We'll pray with you. We'll pray for ourselves too, because we also are in the body. If you need today the prayers of the saints or you need to be uh, baptized, please let your need be known now by coming to the front while we stand and sing.